georeferencing. So I think this is, um, for a few of you who were at, here at the course last week, I'm sure this is one of the key things that you were thinking about. Um, here's a photograph of, of some, uh, uh, hasn't come out terribly clearly, but some uh, frogs in the collections of the American Museum of Natural History in a, an office just kind of along the corridor from, from, from uh, my office at the time. Um, uh, of course, each of these frogs has a, a, a label on it, a record that um, hopefully gives us a very good record of where the, where the sample was taken from. Ideally, we have a very fine record of the latitude and longitude of, of, of the species. In reality, we might be faced with some of these kinds of records. So, you know, we might get a, a label that says, oh, it's found in Woodbury in New York. Okay, this is an example that I was using um, when, when, when we're talking in, in, near the museum in New York. Or it might say near Woodbury. It might say five miles or, or one mile east of Woodbury. It might say ten minutes along the path leading um, out of Woodbury. These are all the kinds of things, particularly when you go back to older labels, that you will you know, really find on labels in museum and of their own um, collections. So there's a, there's a whole industry, if you like, or a whole research agenda and some just tremendous work that's been done in trying to turn these kinds of labels into actual coordinates. The important point for now is that what we need for the distribution models or for the ecological niche models are a current record that we plot in the GIS that are georeferenced as closely as possible, as accurately as possible, um, and, and there are tools out there, um, and, and I know you, those who were here last week went into an, an awful lot of detail on this, it's not my particular expertise, I just want to flag now that there are tools out there to help you with georeferencing, and talk to one of us in particular, chat with town if you have this kind of issue of, of, of data sets that you're trying to get georeferenced. Again, think where we started this morning. Your models are only as good as the data that you can put into them. So the more accurate your occurrence records are, the better data that you have, the more confidence you have in those data, the, more, the better your models will be. Here's just a, a quick flagging of the kind of sources of, of, of distributional data of occurrence records that you might um, Work with, of course, you might be doing a PhD or you might be doing some, some, some surveys of invasive species or, or, or whatever your interests may be. So, you, your group, your team might be actually out doing personal surveys of a particular region. You might be extracting data from large data sets. So, a lot of my um, thesis work um, a few years ago um, was working with um, uh, atlases of, of, of plants and birds in. Um, Europe, where we in, in, often actually digitized, I was going to say in those days, but that makes me sound kind of older and, uh, than I am, and, and, and like years ago that we did this work, but we were actually you know, digitizing a lot of the paper maps that you can do in a, a GIS, and, um, sorry about that, um, uh, so you might actually just take you know, a, a, an old survey that's been done, digitize the data, and, and use those data with um, there are collections, of course, in natural history museums. Um, that's a huge data source and a area. A lot of us come from that, that kind of background of working in, in museums. Um, and increasingly, um, online um, databases as well. This is where we start talking about um, GBIF, the, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, NatureServe is a really good source of, uh, uh, of data in, in North America. Um, as well, and um, uh, HerpNet, um, uh, Ornis, all these many different databases that are increasingly becoming, making biodiversity data available. And the whole week last week was, was on that topic, and we're going to touch on it now and um, chat with one of us in more detail if you're, if you're interested in this. But that's just a flag that it's really something for the future as well. That all this, there's a whole research effort and that to, to, in effect, make biodiversity data available. So make data available that's currently stored in museums and, and that and, and make it available for us to use and, and it's just uh, growing exponentially in terms of the amount of data that, that's available. And remember I'm just here talking about the species occurrence data, Enrique is going to talk about the environmental data which is also just becoming massively um, more and more available at, at a primary resolution. Um, I'm not going to labour this point, and you know we can talk about it more, and, and, and I 
uh, short term vision for a lot of you, but a, a really key point is you've got to be thinking about the coordinate system that you are working with. So, you know, bottom line, we all know um, we tend to reference points on the globe by their latitude and longitude, where it's um, measured as decimal degrees or, or, or degrees minutes seconds from um, measured as angles from, from the center of, of, of the Earth's surface, uh, for, sorry, from the, the, the center of the Earth to, to points on the Earth's surface. Um, but, of course, in geographic coordinate systems, um, that actual sphere that we use, we have to use some sort of um, sphere, a kind of mathematical construct of, 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 of the shape of the Earth, but the Earth is not actually an exact sphere or spheroid. Um, for example, the South Pole is actually a little bit closer to the equator than the North Pole. Um, you know, we, we don't have an exact system to work with here. Um, we use the term uh, datum to define the, the actual origin and, and the, the orientation of those latitude and longitude um, values. Um, and changing um, a coordinate system's datum, i.e. The, the kind of sphere or the, the center point that we're using to, to, to take those measurements, will change your values. There is a standard system, the World Geodetic um, System, WGS 1984, there are others and more, more recent ones, but the key point is that if you use different coordinate systems, um, different datums to reference you know, the same set of values that you have, think you've got a latitude and longitude, but if you don't choose the right datum, then you're going to get error. And that might be just a few meters, but it might be some hundreds of meters or, or even um, kilometers. So, um, to go through that quickly, but the key point is that it's essential to know the coordinate systems that you are working with. Okay? So if you've downloaded some data, if you've got some data from a colleague, if you've been out in the field with your GPS, there's no one of us or, or your colleagues that can say, oh yes, it's this data. You need to know from the kind of metadata or when you obtain that data, you need to know all the kind of metadata, all the information about what the coordinate system was that was used. Um, and to just emphasize as well, I just talked about um, geographic coordinate systems. Well, there are projected coordinate systems as well, of course, where we take those latitude and longitudes and actually project them onto a flat surface. And there are many different ones that we can use. It's a way of representing um, the, the, the systems in, in, in two dimensions. So we inevitably, therefore, when turning a sphere or a spheroid into um, a, a two-dimensional map, we have to distort something, the shape, the area, the distance, the direction. And there are all these different systems that are out there. Some, like Mercator, maintains directions, other maintain areas. Again, you need to know what you're working with whenever you're working with any of these kinds of data. It's absolutely fundamental that you have the metadata that you know what system your data is in. Just to give a, a very quick example, um, this is uh, uh, an example of a neotropical near migrant that was found that is known to be found at high elevations in Ecuador. Uh, a colleague of ours, Catherine Graham, gave me this uh, slide a, a few years ago. Um, queried the, 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 the GBIC, the, the online portal that I emphasize you know, is, is, is a very, very useful and growing um, data source. Um, but this is really a, a kind of word of caution. So this was, these were the data that were available for this neotropical migrant um, back in, in 2006. Spot any problems? Apparently this neotropical migrant is restricted to, to, to North America. But we query that again in 2009, the interface is, is a little bit different, but um, uh, you'll at least see that you know, the, the records are starting to appear down in, in, in Central and, and, and South America. So that's just to emphasize that you know a few years ago there weren't so many data in there, but the amount of data that are coming into these databases from all around the world is um, incredible and it's growing exponentially and these are really important resources and things hopefully kind of through our careers over the next few years we can contribute to and then we'll see that that you know acceleration of the amount of biodiversity data that, that, that are available. Again, another word of caution, you know, you download these data, well, how confident are you in the georeferencing? We just talked about that. How confident are you in the, in the species IDs? It's all very well to download uh, a thousand records, but how many of them are good? How many of them are source populations? How many of them are sink populations? Just trying to get you thinking about the quality of the data and the, you know, the, the, the data that you're working with. 
A final point to make, um, we just wanted to throw it in now because it's something that's going to come back and haunt us, if you like, in a couple of days when we're talking evaluation. As you start playing with your data sets, um, you're going to start um, potentially start dividing them into calibration data sets and testing data sets. So, say you have 100 points, and I'm just going to, well, we're going to represent those here by these, these blocks. And you're going to put 70% of them use them for calibration, and you might keep 30% aside for model testing or for evaluating. So, so we're going to build the model based on a lot of the data, but then we're going to keep some aside that we're going to use to test the data. Okay? And then we're going to make our, 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 our projections um, uh, at a later stage, you know, on Wednesday and Thursday. We just wanted to flag this now, because as you start today and tomorrow with using your data, we might be talking about calibration data versus evaluation data and data splitting. That is simply to say, if you've got 100 points or 10 points or, or 1,000 points, you might keep some of them, kind of pull them aside and use them for, <clears throat> for, for, for testing the model. We just wanted to flag that now as you start using your data, that that's the kind of data splitting that we're talking about. And so, for example, in some of the interfaces that we work with in the MaxN interface, you can actually just fill in a checkbox that says, you know, keep 20% of my current records, it's not talking about environmental data, it's talking about current records, pull them out, keep them separate, and then we'll use those later on to test whether you know, the 80% of the data can predict the 20%. And we'll do that in more advanced ways, we'll talk about different like K-fold partitions where we do that multiple times, we're pulling out different sections, but we just wanted to, to, to flag that now. So what I wanted to say just kind of by way of general introduction to, to, to recurrence data,